So hello, uh, this talk is about the individual case safe to report data quality for suspect products. And I'd like to start by acknowledging Sherry Chang, Nitin Patel and Maggie Fung, who are the data standards team regulatory science staff. Uh, the learning objectives for the talk. Uh, first, we need to be able to identify which technical specification document pertains to electronic ICSR submissions, then to understand the data fields and data sources for the ICSR product data elements, and to describe the best practices in how to submit suspect product information. So the document is specifications for preparing and submitting electronic ICSRs and ICSR attachments technical specification document. It is available online and the most current version is from February this year. The section on drug description uh, has the following information. So medicinal product field should contain the proprietary medicinal product name and the active substance name field, the active drug substance name or names. FDA cannot process an ICSR without at least one of these elements for suspect products. Of course, if you have both, both are preferred, they're more exact. Uh, next, the document describes the medicinal product name and active drug substance name. So if the product has a structured product label, you should use the same naming convention as it appears in the SPL when submitting the ICSR, or if you are submitting a product label as an attachment to the ICSR, then the same name as it appears in that attachment. And uh, if you're only submitting the active substance name, then use the name of that active substance uh, per the preferred name in the substance registration system. Uh, the document also gives some examples of the correct and incorrect manner of submitting information in these structured product fields. So really they should be the clean name and the clean name of the active ingredient. No extra information should be contained. Things like the dosage form or the route of administration belong in other fields, not in the structured product, medicinal product name and active substance name fields. Uh, but just look briefly at the FAIRS product dictionary. It is an internal dictionary. We validate incoming suspect products against this dictionary. And the backbone is the substance registration system. Uh, on top of that, we layer the product names as source from the structured product labeling. And we also reference uh, who drug global for foreign product names. So the dictionary then captures that clean dictionary product name from SPL, the active ingredient and moiety from SRS, and uh, that's what we validate your reports against. So let's look at some examples of the suspect products in ICSR that are submitted in FAIRS. The most common issue uh, with the reported suspects is that the suspect product names contains additional product attributes or characters in that medicinal product field and then the case falls out and we have to manually process it. Sometimes it's just a comma, you know, a punctuation mark. Most often it is the strength or the route. Another issue is that the suspect product name is just too vague, either the product or the active substance. For example, immunoglobulins, this is not a product name or pain medication. Uh, Another issue is that the narrative and the structured field do not match. So the ingredient salt may be stated in the narrative, whereas the structured field shows only the moiety. And this is especially an issue when the product is available as two different salts and they have a different safety profile. Uh, another issue is uh, when there is a family line of products that have different ingredients and the product name is not specified in the structured field, although it is present in the narrative. Uh, also, a common issue is that separate products are reported as if though they're a single multi-ingredient product, and these should not be put together. Separate product need to be listed individually. And uh, also a common issue that a product is reported as a multi-ingredient of all the available salts for that moiety that are out on the market. For example, the narrative states that the patient was on metoprolol, and then in the active substance name, 
all of the salts of metoprolol are listed. Now, a special issue uh, exists with non-unique uh, product names. These are drugs that have the same name, but different ingredients, either domestically or compared to foreign markets. Uh, and what we often see is that such a product name is submitted as that first option that is displayed in the Who Drug Global browser. Uh, whereas the indication can provide insight, the narrative often contains the active ingredient name. Uh, this is not considered, but the default is to that first option in the Who Drug Global, and you know that's that's not helpful. <laughs> um, it is, uh, it is a challenge uh, how to code these non-unique names uh, properly. A recommendation is to specify the ingredient as an addition to the reported drug name, either in brackets or parentheses, to clarify which product it really is. So in summary, uh, submitted suspect medicinal product and active substance name information is reviewed for data quality and coded internally by the FAIRS data quality team. Uh, when available, capture the exact SPL proprietary name in the medicinal product field and capture the SRS preferred name active ingredient in the active substance name field. Uh, we do have an ongoing informal feedback communication through emails with companies to alert them to issues with the structured data for the suspect products. Okay, next uh, we have the challenge question, which of the following statements is true? There are no specifications on how to report drug data in ICSRs. A drug name always identifies a specific drug product. Drug information in the narrative and in the structured fields should match. It is not necessary to provide a suspect drug in an ICSR. Okay, and uh, yes, we have specifications on how to report drug data in ICSRs. A drug name can be non-unique, that's why the active ingredient is essential. Uh, it is necessary to provide a suspect drug in an ICSR, it is one of the four minimum elements. So the drug information in the narrative and in the structured fields should match. Now, which of the following statements is not true? Suspect drug data submitted in ICSRs to FAIRS is validated internally. ICSR product name should match the name in the structured product labeling. ICSR active substance name should match the preferred term name in substance registration system. ICSR drug data is correct. There are no issues. And that is not quite the case today with the ICSR drug data. There are issues. But if we fast forward to a future preview, we can see that the ICSR drug data will be correct and there will be no issues. And that's it. Thank you. Good morning and thank you for the introduction. My name is Manish Kalaria, and today we are going to discuss MEDRA and FAIRS coding. Let me give you a minute to read through the disclaimers and acknowledgements section. Our learning objectives for this lecture are one, to understand what is MEDRA and how it is used in FAIRS. Two, to discuss the existing framework towards harmonization of terminology, coding, and data retrieval, referencing the ICH MEDRA points to consider and companion document. Three, recognize coding accuracy, specificity, and uniformity. What is MEDRA? MEDRA, which stands for the Medical Dictionary for Regulatory Activities, is a global international medical terminology used by regulatory authorities and industry. It is an ICH initiative. 
the International Council on Harmonization of Technical Requirements for Registration of Pharmaceuticals for Human Use. This group was founded approximately 25 years ago to initiate collaboration between regulators and industry to come up with a common language for multiple drug safety fronts as a means for collaboration and harmonization. MEDRA was one of the first projects that the ICH work group undertook to develop. MEDRA is used throughout the regulatory cycle from pre-market to post-marketing, data entry, retrieval and evaluation and proceed presentation. So MEDRA is a product of the ICH. The ICH has a dedicated work group that is in charge of the documents for MEDRA coding and retrieval. They are called the MEDRA Term Selection Points to Consider document and the MEDRA Data Retrieval and Presentation Points to Consider document. Recently in 2018, there was a new Points to Consider companion document added to focus on data quality issues and medication errors that needed further clarification and more examples. There is a global maintenance organization that is responsible for maintaining and upversioning MEDRA known as the MEDRA Support Services Organization or MSSO. So, MEDRA is a global terminology with a global use of standards and global version synchronization. FAIRS and MEDRA Coding Standard. Electronic Individual Case Safety Reports, ICSRs, are submitted to FAIRS with MEDRA coded indications, adverse events, medication errors, and product quality issues with adverse events or medication errors. FAIRS accepts and stores MEDRA codes at the LLT or lowest level term in the current MEDRA version. This is the MEDRA hierarchy. On the bottom is the LLT, which offers the most granularity and is what an event is coded to. There may be many LLTs for a single concept, such as nausea, churning of the stomach, or queasy. They all roll up into a single PT or preferred term, in this case, nausea. Once the term is entered as an LLT, it rolls up automatically by default to the HLT, nausea and vomiting symptoms, which contains many different preferred terms that are related to nausea and vomiting. From here, it rolls up to the high level group term, in this case, gastrointestinal signs and symptoms, and then to the system organ class of gastrointestinal disorders. There can also be terms that roll up to different system organ classes. Take for example, pneumonia bacterial. The LLT and PT roll up ultimately to two different SOCs. One, infections and infestations, and secondary, respiratory, thoracic, and mediastinal disorders. Also, there are 105 standardized MEDRA queries which are a harmonized approach to data retrieval used to search for cases on a particular topic. For example, acute pancreatitis. That SMQ would have all related terms to pancreatitis, including signs, symptoms, and lab tests. MEDRA 23.0 was originally completed in March and was to be deployed on May 4th. But because of the global need, the ICH stepped up through the MSSO and did a re-release in mid-April. There are approximately 80 new COVID-19 related terms and revisions that were implemented, including a new high-level term, coronavirus infections. The majority of other COVID-19 terms are in the SOC investigations, with a smaller set of treatment and exposure terms in the SOC of surgical and medical procedures and the SOC of injury, poisoning, and procedural complications. 
Here are some examples of new COVID-19 terms. Coronavirus pneumonia, which goes to the primary SOC of infections and infestations. We have occupational exposure, which would go to injury, poisoning, and procedural complications. We have antibody tests, positive, negative. Those would all be investigations. And terms such as home quarantine would be listed under surgical and medical procedures. Now that we have looked into MEDRA, let us discuss how it is used in fares. The FDA depends on many different companies to submit accurate and complete MEDRA coded reports. We rely on coded data to perform analysis and generate safety signals. Inaccurate or incomplete coding results in delayed, misdirected, or missed safety concerns. The FDA notes inaccurate coding as misconcepts, soft coding issues, selecting a term which is less specific and less severe than the reported event. For example, hepatitis. If hepatitis is in the narrative and liver disorder is the term that has been selected to capture the event, this would be considered soft coding. So, Overall, MEDRA coding is very good for adverse events. Rarely issues are seen, but what we see challenging is the accurate capturing of medication errors. While there are more than one definitions of a medication error, the FDA has adopted the definition put forth by the National Coordinating Council for Medication Error Reporting and Prevention, NCC MARP. Any preventable event that may cause or lead to inappropriate medication use or patient harm while the medication is in the control of the healthcare professional, patient, or consumer. Note, medication errors exclude off-label use, intentional misuse by patients or care providers, and abuse. And medication errors may or may not result in an adverse event. Medication error reporting to the FDA is voluntary unless associated with an adverse event. However, the FDA strongly encourages reporting of all domestic medication errors, regardless of whether there is or there's not an adverse event. The FAIRS Coding Quality Assurance Program includes continuous review of FAIRS medication error cases for coding quality with frequent informal feedback to companies. So often there are challenges in capturing of events. The same event from the same manufacturer is not always coded the same way. We, we, we receive many cases coded with just the general term medication error rather than the specific error. People often confuse medication error with off-label or intentional misuse terms. There are specific scenarios in the companion document to help with this. Lastly, there are narratives submitted with no adverse events and no medication errors. Here are some examples of incomplete and non-specific coding. She experienced difficulty pressing on the plunger. It was hard to push down and she could not push it down all the way. The submitted code for this report was accidental over underdose. Upon review, it is recommended to use the term device difficult to use because that is exactly what is stated in the narrative. We do not know if she received an underdose or not because she may have subsequently taken a second syringe and injected herself. Another scenario, patient died after receiving verconium instead of the intended midazolam. Submitted term was incorrect dosage administered. Clearly this is not an incorrect dose, but it's rather the wrong drug was administered. Lastly, the patient started drug X but forgot to titrate the dose as instructed by the provider and in the label. 
she experienced GI upset. The submitted codes were medication error, which is very nonspecific, and GI upset. The recommendation is to code drug dose titration not performed and GI upset. Sometimes the term wrong technique in drug or product usage process is used as a catch-all term rather than capturing the specific error reported. For example, first dose of drug X was being infused over 30 minutes. During infusion, the patient had an infusion reaction, developed strider, and drug X was permanently discontinued. The submitted LLTs are wrong technique in product usage process and stridor. Upon review, the narrative does not explain the error and therefore necessitates a label review. The label states, that for drug X on the first infusion, administer over 90 minutes. If there is no adverse event, administer the second infusion over 60 minutes. And if no adverse event on the second, then subsequent infusions can be over 30 minutes. In this case, select the LLT drug administration rate too fast preferred term incorrect drug administration rate. The narrative is expected to contain information that supports all selected codes. In other words, explain in the narrative why a 30-minute first infusion of drug X is an error. The LLT-PT wrong technique in product usage process is a general term often miscoded in place of a specific use error. Do provide complete information in the narratives and select the most specific LLT for the described scenario. This is a literature report describing 104 people who tested positive in post-mortem blood samples for driving under the influence of drugs. Patient one was in a motor vehicle, was a motor vehicle driver suspected of driving under the influence of gabapentin combined with lamotrigine. The blood concentration of gabapentin was 7.5 milligrams per liter. The other drugs detected were lamotrigine at 7.9 milligrams per liter. The submitted term was medication error. Upon FDA review, this is not a medication error report, but rather an impaired driving ability. In looking at the label, it states that the drug may affect driving ability and or operating heavy machinery and to refrain until the patient knows the effect of the drug on their body. Incorrectly inferring a medication error interferes with data summaries and data mining. Code what is stated in the narrative. Obtain needed information to distinguish an adverse event from a medication error intentional from intentional uses quality issues and device functions from a usability issue. Here is the next example. Patient was admitted to the hospital in a comatose state due to an accidental overdose of medication for restless leg syndrome. The labeling on the pharmacy dispensed container indicated to take three tablets a day, but she was actually prescribed to take only one tablet per day. Let's look at the adverse events that were captured. Comatose is an adverse event and was correctly captured. Restless leg syndrome is an indication for use and not an adverse event. Accidental overdose is a downstream error and was correctly captured. Product label issue. This term goes to the HLGT of product quality, supply and distribution, manufacturing and quality system issues. 
In this case, the correct term would be to select wrong directions typed on label, PT, product dispensing error. Issue terms are often product quality terms, not errors. Wrong labeling on the pharmacy dispensed bottle indicates an error, but is not a product quality issue. It did not come from the manufacturer with that label. Rather, it was typed up incorrectly by the pharmacy, and therefore the LLT wrong directions typed on label would be correct. Select the most specific Medra LLT for the described scenario. Check the LLT and PT and up the hierarchy when coding. General expectations and recommendations. A narrative that communicates pertinent information. Accurate coding of information. For example, the consumer misunderstood the drug facts label and used the product longer, you would capture product label confusion and drug administration duration too long. Specific coding, if it is reported that the incorrect dose was actually an extra overdose administered, you would only capture the LLT extra dose administered. Incorrect dose would not need to be added as well. Consistent coding. The ICH Medra term selection points to consider and companion document are excellent references. Challenge question number one. Which of the following is false regarding medication errors? The correct answer is three. Medication error reporting to the FDA is not mandatory, but highly encouraged if there is no associated adverse event. If there is an adverse event, it is mandatory for reporting. Let's look at the other choices. Number one, defined as any preventable event that may cause or lead to inappropriate medication use or patient harm while the medication is under the control of the healthcare professional, patient, or consumer. This is correct. This is the definition that was adopted from the ncc merp Medication errors exclude off-label use, intentional misuse by healthcare providers, patients, and abuse. This is true. And last one, when selecting an LLT or PT to capture medical medication error, check the hierarchy to ensure that the term follows the correct pathway. Question number two, which of the following is true? The correct answer is number four. FAIR's Coding Quality Assurance Program includes continuous review of FAIR's medication error cases for recording quality with frequent informal feedback to the companies. Number one is false because we do have global guides such as the Medra Points to Consider document on identifying and coding of medication error reports. Two is false. It is possible to code medication errors correctly with the correct references and knowledge. Three, it is not sufficient to just code medication error for any reported error. Thank you very much for your time and we'll answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manish and Shmanish and Asian. They were so great. Thank you. And we're going to go ahead and get started with the Q&A. So we have 
um, a chat pod in the bottom right-hand corner. So if anybody would like to ask a question to our presenters, please go ahead and, and uh, enter your question now. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started. This one, first one is for Sonia. If a literature report is about an ingredient that could be in their product or not, how is the be what is the best way to support the suspect drug? Okay, yeah, uh, thanks for that question. That, that, is, that is an excellent question. So if the literature report is about an ingredient and you cannot exclude that it is your drug, you don't know for sure because your drug is, let's say, a brand name and this is an ingredient, but it could be a generic or... So you can't exclude your product. You need to report. Okay, then do not add information. You know, if the literature report has only the ingredient, then report that suspect per the ingredient. Do not pretend that it is your product just because you cannot exclude it. So just leave it with the information that is in that literature report and keep the ingredient as the suspect level of information. Thank you. OK, great. Thank you, Sonia. And we have another question for you. If an unknown product name for pain is reported, how should that be managed by the company? And they're asking non-specified in drug detail or a suspect product field, but generally how to how to. So, so uh, if it's a, a product name uh, and uh, you know it's another suspect and you need to somehow capture it, but you can't find any references for it, you know, I would keep that product name as a suspect, but um, it would be helpful if you've done the due diligence and you can't find any sources for it, then, then put the ingredient, the unspecified ingredient, then we know that you've, you know, that you've looked. Um, I would, if it's, however, something like patient was on pain medication, so it's like a class of products, that can stay in the narrative. That does not need to go into suspect products. So classes of drugs should stay in the narrative. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, our next question is for Manish. Has the FDA considered whether to actually require med error reporting mandatory as opposed to voluntary encourage, regardless of whether or not it is associated with an adverse event? There's no adverse event. It's totally voluntary. And at this point, it has not changed. Perhaps in the future, it may not. It may. But as of now, uh, no. Thank you. Okay, great. And another question for you. If the reported adverse event is ambiguous and there are two options, one is softer than the other, what do you have a suggested protocol to consider on which one to select? Uh, that's a great question. Absolutely. Um, I think you need to read the narrative and pick out the facts from the narrative. Uh, don't make inferences. Don't make conclusions. Uh, don't make assumptions. Just go by what is exactly there. And then sometimes if it is ambiguous, you may choose a softer term rather than choosing the harder term, but it being incorrect. So. It's on a case-by-case -case basis, but I do understand that the situation comes up. And so it's to go by exactly what you can pick out from the narrative, as someone else would also pick out from the narrative. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. And this will be our last question for Manish. How can I or my organization submit a request for a new LLT or PT term to be added to the Medra Dictionary? Sure, great question. Um, anyone with a MEDRA subscription may put in a change request to the MSSO um, on the MEDRA.organization website. Um, and then the MSSO will make a decision on whether that term is accepted or not. You have a right for an appeal process. Just to let you know, the FDA does not, is not involved in the decision-making process. Um, we are also just as well. We're subscribers as well. Uh, just to keep uh, in line, uh, people can remember that the deadline for the fall version is in June, and then the deadline for the May version that will come out next year would be in December. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for explaining um, how that gets updated. And with that, thank you guys both again for your presentations and for 